meeting. Let's begin our prayer meeting with a time of prayer. Uh, let's gather around the altars and the front pews and wherever you wish to join, join in prayer. Pray as you feel led to pray, aloud or quietly, or how you feel led in your spirit. And uh, I'm going to ask Brother Rance, when people's hearts are clear, Brother Rance, could you uh, close for us in prayer? Thank you. Lord, we come, come to the in prayer tonight. We thank you, Lord, for a God that we hear tonight, Lord, in our service. We thank you, Lord, for a God that hears and answer prayers on the throne. Lord, we pray tonight, Lord, in our prayer meeting services. And we're going to be praying for a revival that's going to be coming up in the next few weeks. And Lord, we pray thou that we you send the evangelist, Lord, to help him as he prepares for the message for each night. And Lord, we pray thou just guide and conduct him, Lord. And Lord, we pray thou help our people, Lord, each and one of us, Lord, just mind God. And let God have control. And let God have the right of way in this revival, Lord. Because Lord, we realize tonight, Lord, we need this revival in a mighty way. We need this revival, Lord, to call the people that's praying away to God. And Lord, we want to see them come back and let God have the right of way. Let God have control of their lives again. Lord, we pray thou just guide and direct each one of us tonight, Lord. Help us, Lord, to pray thou just answer prayer. As our pastor, Lord, tonight as he brings the message of not even, Lord, he pray the power of God and give him the word to say. And Lord, bless our saving, Lord, tonight we pray. Lord, we pray thou, God, that we serve tonight has never failed. We're so thankful, Lord, for that. We're so thankful, Lord, that God is able to do the things that are impossible no man or woman could ever do. Lord, we thank you tonight for that. And Lord, we just pray thou in this happy way. At your prayer, we pray. Guide and direct us, Lord. Oh, mighty God. We just love you so much tonight. We love you right now, Lord. And Lord, we just love you tonight so much. And Lord, we just can't praise you tonight. And God, Lord, you have done so much for us. And God has helped us from time after time and, and touched these old bodies and helped us, Lord, with our physical. And help us, Lord, with our spirituals. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, for that. We just can't praise you enough, Lord. Have your precious way, Lord, in this service tonight. Bless the text of the Lord, and Lord, and may the people of the earth today. The Lord, bless our singers, Lord, we pray. Guide and direct each one. And Lord, we pray now. We just want you to, Lord, just help us. That we'll mind you, Lord, and do your will. We thank you, Lord, tonight for answering prayer for someone, Lord, we know. And Lord, we praise you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. I failed to mention it before prayer time tonight, but we need to be remembering our brother Greg Ferguson. Uh, brother Greg is with a volunteer trip in Louisiana right now. Uh, That's right. Restoring things that have been uh, broken and rebuilding homes and ministering to the people there, literally, with the hands and feet of Jesus, putting things back together. And so if you think of it, pray for brother Greg this week. He's been there since, I believe, last Sunday or Saturday, and he won't be with us again until a week from today. So, and especially that, because there's another storm bearing down. That's on right. Them. That's right. So pray for their safety of that crew, and uh, he's with. I think it's a big outfit of, of people who do this on a regular basis, and he's just he's just joined for this time around. So let's remember to pray for him. Let's begin tonight on our feet, singing. I have decided to follow Jesus. And if you can uh, testify to that tonight, you can wave your hand. And if you can't testify to that tonight, we have an altar of prayer where I would invite you to come and to meet Jesus and make the decision to turn your life over to him this evening. It's worth every minute. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided. Follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. Follow Jesus. 
Decide now to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Praise the Lord. Right across the page, number 467, Higher Ground. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I'm onward bound, Lord plant my feet on higher ground, Lord lift me up and let me stand, by faith on heaven. singing tonight. You know, when we choose to follow Jesus, there is an initial decision that is to be made. There's that crisis moment. Am I going to choose Christ or am I going to choose self and the world? And after you make that decision for Christ, you begin a journey. And it's an upward journey. That's why we sing about higher ground. We want to be drawing closer and closer to the Lord, learning more and more about serving Him better and understanding Him better by and by. And it's constant, constant learning. If you're a Christian, you're a student. <laughs> I'm sorry if you didn't like school, but you're a student. I wonder if anybody came tonight with a testimony on their heart, or perhaps you have felt stirred since you've been here to share something that God has done for you, and you'd like to share with the body of Christ. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. And we rejoice with you, Mindy. Wow. 
God's spirit at work in your heart. Grace, God's power to bring change in you, and then his power to bring change through you. Praise the Lord. Someone else have a testimony tonight? Thank you for that good report, Mindy. All right. We're going to keep on moving here through the music. Number 475. Deeper, deeper in the love of Jesus. We're all about growing tonight. Growing in Christ. Growing in grace. Let's sing together. I wonder if someone else has a testimony. Anybody at all? All right. We're going to keep singing then. It's number 480. As you go along in life with Christ, and as you seek that closerness to Him, as you seek that higher ground, constantly being a student of His Word and understanding Him more and more, you will come to find that the Christian life is all about letting God be first. My thoughts, my cares, my ambitions are second place. And what Christ's will for me is becomes first. And this song came to mind today. It's a simple song. We don't sing it as often as we should. But it says simply, have thine own way, Lord. It's a song of surrender. It's a song of putting yourself in the back seat and saying, Lord, I want you to be the leader of my life. Every decision, every action, every thought, every motive, captain to your Holy Spirit. And so let's let this song convict us tonight as we sing it together. Have 
out tonight I see different ones who I know are struggling with different burdens some of you are praying for sisters some of you are praying for your children some of you have no job right now some of you are looking at the instability of the future of a spouse or family member and I want to say tonight none of those problems have caught the Lord by surprise He's still ruling and reigning supremely, even when we're not singing the song, Our God Reigns. It's a truth that protrudes through all of time, through all situations, even when we're so focused, to, so tempted to focus on the bad, on the things that aren't going right. Our Heavenly Father knows all about what's weighing your heart down tonight. And I'd like for us to sing a verse, I don't know if it's in the queue, but it's, I give all my family to you. And I have young children. And they have to grow up in this world long after you folks are all gone and done voting. And so I'm going to pray for my family tonight and my children. And whatever it is, however that plays into your life, submit it to God. Because when you submit it to God and you take your hands off, it's not just left hair. He's taken it. If you've laid it at his feet, he's taken it. And it's become his burden, no longer yours. Does that mean stop praying for it? Absolutely not. But it means it's in his care. Let's sing family. I give all my family to you. song, but if you listen to Caleb, you'll probably be able to sing right along. Okay. Bless the Lord, oh my 
soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. It's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass, and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Let's open our Bibles to Mark chapter 1. I want to begin reading at verse 29. Mark chapter 1, verse 29. Let's stand together as we read the word. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, 
And they told Jesus about her. So he went to see her and took her by the hand and helped her up. The fever left her and she began to wait on them. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon possessed. The whole town gathered at the door and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house and went out, went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, let's go somewhere else to the nearby villages so that I can preach there also. That is why I have come. And so he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Father, we praise you and we thank you for the clear teaching of your word. Speak to our hearts with the clear voice of your spirit in Jesus name. Amen. You may be seated. What do you think? Was this place, this place where the scripture says in verse 35 that Jesus went off to a solitary place where he prayed, do you think that place was also a place of battle? Seeking for strength and for courage. Strength and courage. I think a lot of people think that we're born with it, strength and courage, or not. They assume that some are gifted and some are not gifted and let the courageous be the courageous and let the, the strong be the strong and the rest of us will just be whatever it is we are. No, I don't think that's it. Both strength and courage have their same roots in grace. I define grace this way, it is God's power that is released in us to bring change in us and then to bring change through us. He doesn't give us grace to make us a depository of grace, but to turn us into a channel of grace in the world. And that when grace touches us, our courage is fired and we are made stronger. And you wonder sometimes, those of you who have been Christians for a while, where did that come from? You walk away from a conversation and you say to yourself, whatever came over me there, I, I can't believe I said that. I, I can't believe I did that. And, and you look back and it's, it's not you. It, it's, it's God's grace infusing you with courage and with strength when the moment calls for it and is there and the Holy Spirit brings it forward. And so there's a battle for strength and a battle for courage going on here. What makes me think that? Well, on one side, we have all the crushing labors that Jesus has just faced in the, in the town of Capernaum. And it's a lot. A lot of things happened that day. And then he comes home for supper and he's got to heal Peter's mother-in-law, which settles the age-old question, was Peter ever married? The answer is yes. Well then, what about that? that that's one part of it. But what's the other part of it? Well, there's more. That evening after sunset, verse 32, the people brought to Jesus the sick and the demon possessed and the whole town gathered at the door and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Sounds like part of the continuation of the crushing pressure from Capernaum, doesn't it? Have you ever thought to yourself, why were there so many demon-possessed people in the Middle East at that time? They're around. They're not as scarce as you might think they are. And uh, I think sometimes when you come face to face with them, you're shaken awake to that reality. Uh, demon possession 
is the direct result of darkness, spiritual darkness. And the more spiritual darkness there is in the land, the more likely people are to be possessed by the devil. I worked for 10 years as a missionary in a country where the people had worshiped demons for 600 years. And their, their houses of worship throughout the land had a very interesting shape to them. They were called house winds, and it was the place where the spirits of the demons dwelt. And they would go there and pray to the demons and ask the demons to give them special powers and uh, strengthen them to, to do particular things. They were inviting demon possession. Let me just say that I've lived in that country long enough to recognize that in my country, there are a lot of people who are asking for it too. And they don't know what they're playing around with. Uh, we need to understand that, that there is a physical world, a political world certainly, but there's a spirit world too. And we've got to be careful how we act and what we do. Because we sometimes can invite the devil into situations that we don't want him in the situations. And we need to think about what it is that's going on around us. Let me tell you something. Some of the things that are going on are, are being directed by demons. And we need to recognize that and understand that. So part of the battle is this pressure that Jesus felt from Capernaum and all the struggles that were going on. Do you know there's grace to work miracles? For those who God should draw into our presence or bring to us. Sometimes the Lord will bring people to you for you to help them. Well, who am I? You are a child of God. And as a child of God and a recipient of God's grace, you have the strength and the courage to do the things that God needs you to do for those people. That's why he brings them to you. He doesn't bring them to you so that you can waste your time or they can waste their time, but so that you might be able to minister to them. And so this, this makes all the more important our devotion in life, doesn't it? Because it's out of the wealth of that that we're strengthened with grace and, and we understand uh, what God's will is and the word of God gets into our heart and into our mind. And in circumstances, we find ourselves speaking God's word into the situation and God begins to change people's lives. What's happening? Grace is making a change and, and miracles are happening. I'll never forget back in the 70s, there was a songwriter uh, that I liked because I liked his style of poetry. But I, but I remember uh, him writing a song about how he didn't believe in miracles. I don't believe in miracles. He, that was the name of the, the song. But uh, toward the end of the, the first verse, he, he says, and then, and then I walked right into your presence and all my fears fell on the floor. Do you, do you think a miracle could be happening to me? Yeah, miracles are still going on. They're still taking place. People's lives are being changed. People who are going one direction are going another direction. Most psychiatrists today will tell you that that's impossible. That what you are and the direction you're going is what you're ever going to be. And, and uh, all you do is get older and become more of yourself. They don't believe in a real change like that is possible. They think that with medication and some counseling that, that uh, maybe you can learn to control the, the baser motives of your life and the more destructive things in your life. But the truth is, you are what you are. and That's the way you are until the end of your life. And they, they believe that. They teach that. They're wrong. Because God's able to work a miracle of grace in people's lives. And, and their lives can be radically changed. And so Paul, who's out to destroy the church, becomes a, a, an apostle in the church. And the writer of the most of the New Testament. So there's real change that is possible. But uh, that was part of the trouble. The work with those people required that you pour out grace. And when you do work with people, you pour grace out. Do you, do you understand that? that? That grace comes into you, but it also goes out of you. And when it goes out of you, it affects you in terms of your strength. You become weakened physically and spiritually. We must constantly be taking grace in and then pouring it out to people who are around us. And so when it weakens us spiritually and physically, then we need to, 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 to do what Jesus did. Go to a solitary place and spend some time in prayer. How much more so when the battle with various diseases and demon possession is going on, how much more do we need God's grace? Um, 
When I was in uh, Papua New Guinea, I would go out to a church sometimes and, and it just looked like it was going to be a complete flop. I sometimes had driven out to, to some extreme places and, and I'm there pretty much by myself. The church is there, sort of, the grass building that they built, but there's nobody else there. And it's raining and uh, nobody's around. And so I would just get back in the truck and try to stray dry and not freeze to death up there sometimes in those hills. While you're on the equator, you can still freeze when you're 6,000 feet up in the air. And so it was a little chilly. And, and, and finally an hour or two hours later, people would start drifting in. And, you know, they, they don't have the same concept of time that we do. Just whenever the weather got better, then it was all right. Oh, okay, now let's, now let's go. And the church would fill up and you would think, you might be sitting there for two hours uh, thinking to yourself, oh, brother, this really is, a, is a, a flop, a waste of gas and a waste of my time. And, and, and people show up. And then when you hold an altar call, the altars fill up. Sometimes two or three times. And, and people who are known in that community to be hardened criminals give their hearts to the Lord and their lives really change. And maybe in two years after that, I'll see them at the Bible college because God's called them to preach. And we do believe in the, these possibilities of change, but we really do need to re restore our strength and restore our courage. And it's required that we do that. And I think Jesus understood that because of the work that had been behind him and because of the work that would lay ahead of him, he was just about to take off on a preaching tour. And he was going to go all around that area and preach. But he also could see the gathering clouds of trouble. The Pharisees were getting really upset with what he was doing. And there was trouble coming from that group. And in those two areas, that was other things he was going to have to face. And he needed grace and he needed strength. He needed courage in order to deal with those things. The days ahead would require strength. They would require courage. And if Jesus needed courage to face the, the battles that he was in and was facing, then what about us? And sometimes the victory is determined while we're in our time of prayer before we ever do get to the battle. But we need to prepare ourselves for it in prayer. And so we find him going off to a solitary place to pray. What do you think that we ought to do? wonder how many lives would be strengthened. Maybe the tone of their life would be changed from anxious and timid to one of courage and power if they would just learn the secret of the inner fellowship with God. I began praying when I was a young Christian in the army, uh, spending time in the evenings when I wasn't on work, just praying for about an hour or two hours sometimes. And uh, just praying for God's presence and for his help. And I found that, that as I did that, I wasn't going around like a uh, hired gun looking for trouble. But the odd thing was, it found me. I would be somewhere, something would go on, and God would pull that grace and, and, and that strength and courage and help me to know what to do. I, um, I was a paramedic and they... They called me to, a, to a, uh, an infantry outfit and they said, we've got a man out here on the ledge and he's going to jump. Well, one side of the building, it wasn't all that high up to the windows, but the side of the building he was on, it was way up there. And I don't know if you know this about me or not, I don't like high places. And so I went there and they had these big windows and I leaned out the window and I looked and sure enough, there was this little guy, little skinny guy, he was just shaking like a leaf. And, and I said to him, what are you doing out here? He said, well, I'm going to kill myself, Doc. And I said, why are you going to do that? He said, well, his girlfriend already wrote him a letter. And so he just took a whole bunch of uh, morphine tablets. And he's staying out there on that ledge. And he, when a morphine takes over, then he's going to fall off the ledge and die. So I pulled my head back in. And I said, to, where's his friends, his roommates? And the MPs handed him over to me. And I said, does that guy have morphine tablets around here? He said, well, not anymore. He took them. There wasn't any time to decide anything. I immediately dove out the window and grabbed that little guy by the front of his shirt and yanked him off that ledge and back in the window and threw him down on the ground. I said, put handcuffs on him. I'm going down to the dispensary and have a cup of coffee. Bring him along. 
Because <laughs> I was really scared hanging out that window holding on to that guy. <laughs> and I needed to kind of calm my nerves a little before I treated him. I said to him, did you really take 30 tablets of morphine? It was just little skinny guys. The doctor came down and he didn't believe it. Now nah, he didn't take that. And I mean, he, he had cut himself going out on the ledge. And so the doctor was was there and I was sewing him up. And I, while I was sewing him up, I was watching him starting to just get sleepier and weaker. And I said, hey, doc, his breathing slowing down. Something's not going on here. And he, he came over and he said, oh, dear Lord, I think he's really take those tablets. What do we got to do? And I, and, and I said, well, we got to pump his stomach out. What do you mean, what do we got to do? So, so I got a stomach pump, and I started pumping the guy's stomach out. He got his stomach all pumped out, and, and uh, we did everything we could to keep him alive and keep him awake. We shot him with Narcon. They had that back then. It was in these little plastic guns, and you just walk up and shoot somebody in the shoulder with it. And the great thing about Narcon is you take those drugs, and it just overwhelms those drugs in your blood. And so we gave him a shot, and the doctor was a little concerned. He gave him a second shot of it, and I thought, you know, we need to kind of take it easy here. We've had too much drugs in this whole thing. The doctor was kind of excited by that time because he's afraid he's about to lose somebody. And so, and he couldn't help it. He was exhausted from the day and sleepy himself. And, and so we, we took care of him. We finally just picked a little guy up, and I took him upstairs and turned a cold shower on and held him up and just got him good and washed and turned around, held up the other side and got him good and wet and took him down and dried him off and put some clothes on him and, and put him in bed. And a little guy was, was sort of a little bit awake. And I said, you know, why did you do that? And he, he said, well, he, this girl, I said, let me tell you something. If, if you look out that window, there are thousands of girls out there, literally thousands of them. Well, this was my girl. So what? Find another one. <laughs> what do you mean? I said, the Bible promises that my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And he said, you mean a girlfriend? I said, yeah. Oh, well, how do I get God to help me to do that? Well, first of all, you need to ask him to forgive you for being stupid. And then you need to pray and ask the Lord to give you directions to find a girlfriend. And I prayed with the guy to get a girlfriend. You think that sounds... <laughs> I'm telling you what happened. He got saved. That little guy started going to church with us. He became a regular member. Later on, uh, he was a Southern Baptist. He started preaching. He went to Florida went to seminary, then he went up to North Carolina, I think it was, Mars Hill, went to seminary there, and then he got a church up there in the mountains and uh, was pastoring that church. I, I knew another guy who was pastoring near him and he told me he was doing real well, young guy. Is that a miracle? Yeah, it is. How did that happen? Well, let me tell you something, hanging out the window and grabbing somebody is not my thing, you know? But I knew if he had taken all those drugs, I didn't have a lot of time to fool around and beg him to walk back in. So I just snatched him off the, off the little guy. Up. I nearly throttled him, getting him through the window. I got him down on the floor. You know, the problem is that we're too timid and we're too anxious. And the reason we're so timid and we're so anxious is that because we don't connect with the power of God, we just don't believe we can do anything. And we need to understand that greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. We need to understand that. And there are times where we find ourselves speaking up when we normally wouldn't or, or acting out when we normally would not. Where we find strength being manifested in us. What's going on? God's grace is flowing in us and it's flowing through us. We, we find ourselves. And I remember I was talking to my roommate who knew me well. And he said to me, he said to me, uh, because he was down to the, the hospital when I was up there taking care of that guy and brought him down. He, he said, one of the MPs told me you reached out the window, snatched that guy off the ledge. And I said, yeah, I did. Probably only weighed about 110 pounds soaking wet. And, and the, he said, but that's the third store of that, of that infantry unit up there, third story. He said, that's got to be 30 feet down to the ground or more. And there's cobblestones down there. And I said, yeah, I know. <laughs> Stop talking about it, Bob. <laughs> it's not making me feel good. 
whatever made you do that? I said, I think the Lord made me do it. And he said, well, then in that case, it's all right because Bob was a believer. Those quiet, solitary times where we spend a little bit of time with the Lord are, are gold. And they are power and they are grace and they are courage. I read a little story today that uh, kind of fit this sermon and I wanted to share it with you. I read that before every great battle, the Emperor Napoleon would stand alone in his tent, just stand there. And one by one, his marshals, who were the commanders over armies and the commanders who were over smaller armies, each would come to his tent one at a time and they would walk in without saying anything to him and just take his hand and hold it. And then they would let go and walk out. They all did that before the battle started. They described it this way. They said after holding the emperor's hand, they walked out of that tent with fire in their heart. They were ready to die for France. I think some such thing happens to us sometimes when we're with the Lord. Sometimes he gives us peace. Sometimes he gives us courage. Sometimes he settles down the things that are disturbing us. Sometimes he gives us strength and stirs us up. But we come away from that quiet time very much like those marshals did from Napoleon. But not with some phony courage, but with courage that rises from grace because God has given us something. And we're different because of it. Solitary places where the battle's won. Not out there where we fight it. It's won in the solitary place for strength and courage. And that's the power of prayer and the value of it. And if we're going to call prayer a battlefield, then one of the things we need to win in that place is win enough grace to give us both courage and strength because there are demon-possessed and dangerous people out there and folks who desperately need somebody who can touch them and won't be afraid to touch them and who will believe enough that if necessary, we'll cast the demons out. Father, search our hearts. Fire our hearts with the understanding of what we can be because we've been with you. As you sent the disciples out and gave them power to, to cast demons out and to preach the word, you give us power and you give us courage and it comes from your grace. Let it be poured out liberally in our lives, Lord. And help us never to be timid or bashful but to step forward and do clearly what you're calling us to do and calling us to be. Even if afterwards we're a little shocked, don't mind that. We're just surprised at what your grace has done through us. And it gives us a reason to praise you. And we do, in Christ's name, amen.